I'd like to um, uh, show you some more concrete examples of what this means. Now, I know that's a lot. Uh, what I showed you earlier was a lot of detail and a lot more sort of um, you know information that you might want. If you're interested in reviewing that, I definitely recommend um, uh, essays, for example, in the uh, um, out of context um, uh, exhibition catalog that I mentioned. I think it's also written on your sheet. But what I want you to understand is the kind of possibilities um, that one uh, faces. So any time after the fifth century. You have a whole range. Your default would probably be some sort of standard or, uh, or semi-cursive script to write in. But you have all these different possibilities for just basic scripts to write in. And what you also get around the 4th and 5th century, and I've I skipped this part in the, uh, in the um, uh, interest of brevity, is famous artists like Wang Shijie, who makes a, um, who becomes the standard that everyone wants to follow, or a, a significant number of people want to follow. And so, and much of calligraphic learning is copying these old masters, finding, um, finding the greats, and, and trying to um, uh, do the same thing. Now, if you um, were to do this yourself, let's say you love Abraham Lincoln, and you got some of his letters, and you wanted to, for, for whatever reason, emulate him in some way, and you're trying to uh, learn his, uh, his writing style, there's less going on in um, sort of pen writing, like uh, hard point pen writing, because you, um, uh, there's less variation. But no matter how closely you try to hew to it, there'll always be some sort of um, specific aspect of you that's going to come out. Why is that? Well, a large part of it is we have different bodies. And uh, so just the, the micro ways that our hands will move and our arms will move, it's going to be quite different. And that becomes one of the really interesting things to see in subsequent, uh, subsequent times, as this sort of copying tradition is never a perfect copy. And that, that's, that's, they're quite well aware of that um, in China and beyond. So one of the ways I want to think about copying is, um, uh, or emulation, is not simply in derivativeness, but in dialogue. Um, and so these figures from the past are still quite alive and are re in each time, and the, the present-day figures are able to do something new in dialogue with them. Uh, I'm not a um, literature person, um, uh, but um, I remember when I first became interested in poetry again in grad school, English uh, uh, poetry, and I was particularly interested in spoken word poetry. And one of the things that I thought was uh, fascinating about that is the way that when I read a Yeats poem or um, a Keats or something like that, um, my, bo uh, my body, is shaped in a certain way. I, 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 if I speak it out, my voice and my, uh, my mouth will be shaped in ways that the, art, uh, that the uh, original poets were as well. And that kind of connection, connection both to sort of the original character, to the sort of feelings of this, this is something uh, somewhat akin that we have in uh, an East Asian context. So one place we might start, um, I mean, the, one of the strengths of, um, of the collection here is of Ming and Qing um, uh, materials, so, um, what in a Chinese context would be sort of later materials, say, certainly from the 17th century on, there's some really uh, wonderful pieces. But they're late in the tradition, but they're very much um, interested in a dialogue with that past. So just um, uh, you know, looking at, say, the tombstone uh, information about this, um, uh, this particular work, it's a poem by Li Bai in semi-cursive script um, uh, by Fu Shan. Um, and uh, so we have Fu Shan, who's a 17th century, um, uh, uh, 17th century um, uh, bureaucrat and, uh, or a scholar and, um, uh, and calligrapher. But he's taking a poem written by someone, uh, someone else. Li Bai, if you know Chinese poetry, Li, excuse me, Li Bai and Du Fu would be the uh, probably uh, two most famous um, names everyone would know. And you know, sometimes there's a tendency to think, well, here's old person one and old person uh, two working. But you know, think about for this for a moment. We're we're talking a, a distance of, okay, do I have the right? Nine hundred years, um, and. 900 years, by any standards, is a very long time. Now, Li Bai is still very much alive and well in the 17th century, and in the 21st century as well. And so, and he's been reproduced orally, in written word, many, many times each time. And each person sort of puts their own, um, uh, own um, sort of stamp on this. Now, 
here's Fushan. He's choosing to do Levi. He's choosing a particular poem by Levi and a particular way of doing this. This is, you know, I think you call it semi-cursive script. Who was, you know, um, Levi? Well, he was known for his... Um, uh, his sort of untrammeledness. Um, uh, he was in, uh, known to um, uh, love uh, love drink and the like. There's a kind of freedom uh, that if maybe Sean is trying to um, express through here. As far as I know, we don't have any um, works attributed to Levi, so he's not emulating his writing, uh, his, his calligraphic style, um, but Fushan is emulating kind of a spirit of this, uh, this person. There's a kind of communion uh, that's being, um, uh, being created here. But just as much as an entrainment with the past, it's often going to be a shift. Now, what we could do is show, you know, um, I would bet it's probably 50 extant works, at least, of um, people um, depicting Li Bai poems in previous to this time. So Fushan is not just thinking about Li Bai, he's thinking about all the people that came before. So in any given work, there's a great deal that's encoded. Choosing um, this, um, uh, this uh, semi-cursive script is, um, perhaps gives a sense of informality and a kind of, um, uh, kind of freedom. And the, um, but his own personality, just like if I were to uh, recite a, um, uh, an English poem or something like that, especially with my voice today, um, the, there's uh, no way that it could be anything but Kevin Carr's rendition of that. And in the same way, this is very much Fushan's rendition of Li Bai, his own visual voice um, executed in this work. Now, here's another one. Um, this is a, uh, a well-known calligrapher and scholar named Yibing Sho. And um, there's... Uh, you know, visually two parts of this. So um, there's four characters right here, um, uh, uh, across here, and then uh, these characters here, probably in a, um, uh, I think you'd call it a semi-cursive style. These four characters, because you understood everything that I said and have completely memorized, you would know, uh, know instantly that we're looking at something that's um, a, um, uh, a clerical script. Why is it clerical script? You have the big sweeping strokes, a kind of, um, uh, a kind of insistent uh, symmetricality, and um, a sort of, it, what does this look like? Well, it looks older. It looks more sort of established. Um, this is something that is um, beautiful, beautiful in a kind of archaic way. When were they using clerical script actively? Well, second century BC, first century BCE. So, Again, uh, we're talking, um, what, 1,900 years or so um, uh, difference? It's really is it astounding to think about that kind, of, um, uh, that kind of historical continuity. So just like I was saying, there's a certain way, and I'll try and uh, get to some examples of this, just as I was saying that um, a, an, uh, an artist is um, able to um, make connections to other countries and other times, and, um, and this is going back into this distant, uh, distant past and bringing it to the present day, by using these characters, they're giving it a sense of, uh, he's giving it um, uh, this title of a, a particular um, uh, place, giving it a, a sense of archaic sort of um, beauty and majesty. Now, this isn't always a sort of straightforward emulation. Let's look at a piece like this. And, and again, we're looking at a lot of pieces that are Quite, um, uh, quite late in the, uh, relatively late in the uh, artistic tradition, but I think are <coughs> quite interesting for sort of thinking about this uh, earlier time. So Zhao uh, Zhuqian was a, um, a 19th century artist, and, but he's um, quoting a, uh, a couplet, uh, two lines, from a poet named uh, Yuan Haoyuan. Uh, well, I'm sorry, Yuan Haoyuan. And um, so what style is this? Well, if this is clerical script, we're looking here at a kind of seal script, something that's going back uh, much, much uh, farther. Now, from the, the 17th century, there was a move to start to essentially skip all the history, uh, uh, the subsequent, um, uh, the, uh, subsequent history, say, from the 5th century on, to go back to something that's more authentic, uh, deeper, and, uh, and more connected with the past, a kind of imagined beautiful past of uh, Chinese history. But it's, a, it's an interesting piece because, you know, certainly in Yuan Haoyuan's time, no one was naturally writing in, um, in seal script. So it's not a nod to, his histor uh, to uh, Yuan's historical uh, period, but a much earlier time. 
And then I think it's, uh, it's significant. If we think of seal script as old and staid and ancient and all the, uh, these things, when we look at um, uh, the, these particular pieces here, like uh, looking in close up, these characters um, here on the right read one cup of wine. And so, you know, it's, uh, uh, there's a, um, they're talking about um, drinking. And this is interesting when we, we, you know, we don't think of the great ancients necessarily, uh, at least in, the, uh, in a sort of European context maybe, of sort of getting drunk and the like. But there's a kind of, I think, ironic use of this, um, uh, of this uh, seal script style um, to um, uh, being associated with something sort of free and easy. So the same, uh, the same lines, one cup of wine, think of it written in, say, a uh, in a kind of crazy um, uh, cursive style, you know, these, these rough cursive style. In fact, many of the people famous for doing the, um, uh, the wild cursive were um, thought to be drunk or were sort of uh, imagined to be drunk when they did this. Here's someone who's working to make this seal script, but writing about drinking. And, and I didn't mention it earlier, but I think it's, uh, it's worth mentioning here. In order to make these forms with a flexible brush, it's actually more laborious uh, than it uh, would be um, to make um, city forms that would look more like this, because the, the rounded edges need to be hidden. So there's a sort of way that you kind of um, twist, the, um, uh, twist the flexible brush, and you're trying to get this, this effect like it's done with a stylus, but in ink. So <clears throat> these are very much contrived effects, and not contrived in a necessarily negative way, but something that's often using uh, the past to present a kind of identity, and often um, some sort of ironic commentary or a, uh, or a um, shift on that. Now here's another one. Du Fu is an 8th century um, uh, poet or contemporary of uh, Li Bai, who we saw in a moment uh, before. And this is... Um, I think this is the first Japanese uh, piece uh, we, uh, we looked at. This is a um, set of... Um, uh, of of calligraphy pasted onto screens, uh, on a folding screen. And it's by a man named Yamo Koteshu, around the same time as uh, uh, Fushan and some of, the, uh, uh, some of the other ones we, we just saw. But look at this um, uh, way that it's written. Now, Du Fu is a very famous calligrapher. Um, the particular sort of um, content of his, um, uh, of his poems might be um, well known, at least to a sort of educated uh, elite. So the content is not near as important. And I'd be hard pressed, I, I didn't um, uh, sit down and try to figure out where this is from. I'd be hard pressed, so I think I could find it, but hard pressed to figure out what the original poem of this is. But in a sense, it doesn't matter. What, Yamoka Teshu is doing uh, for us is a kind of uh, performance of this poem, of a, a reinterpretation uh, of a particular poem in a way that's, um, uh, that's active and, um, uh, and wonderfully sort of, um, uh, sort of these tumbling down of these characters. And <coughs> he doesn't lift the, uh, uh, for example here, maybe he lifts his brush once uh, in this wonderful sort of squiggle that is, again, more like music than it's like words. You can think about um, covers, uh, like musical covers. So, so one person um, takes another, one, uh, another person's um, uh, song and, and redoes it. And sometimes uh, they might shift the lyrics in an erratic way or, uh, or to make it more contemporary, or they might um, uh, reorchestrate it, all these sort of things. That's very much similar to what's going on here. And if we're thinking about this sort of dialogue, remember that Yamakateshu is living in Japan in the 19th century. Du Fu was living in China in the 8th century. So we're talking um, not only a huge gap of time, but of um, cultural context. And to give a similar example, uh, uh, another example, say, from, from uh, Korea, Kim Jong, uh, Jong-hui is a famous, um, uh, is a well-known uh, calligrapher in, <coughs> in the Korean context. Now, like most of the educated male elite in Korea, he's writing in what looks like Chinese and can be uh, readable as Chinese. Now, he's doing it in a kind of, um, uh, in a, what seems like a rather informal, um, uh, sort of slightly cursive style. But he, the actual content of this uh, inscription is quite interesting. This is just my rough translation. I, I'd have to think of this more, but... Um, Basically, my writing is fundamentally without discipline or rules, this fa, yet the old man always has a poem in his breast. Um, this old man always has a poem in his breast. 
So he's saying, my writing is fundamentally without, um, uh, without sort of the, um, the structures uh, and like, um, but he's always coming out with a poem. Now, I think it's a good moment to think about what one is doing when one is, does calligraphy. Because most of one's uh, calligraphic education or um, education writing is a copying um, thing. You, um, you look at pieces and you try to emulate them as closely as possible. And just like Confucius has this uh, famous line about um, emulating um, that when he, oh, I'm not going to get it right, uh, that as time went on, um, he, he, uh, he learned the rules, but he, he uh, internalized those rules so thoroughly that by, uh, by the time he was an old man, he could do anything he wanted, or seemed to do anything he wanted, and he still worked within those rules. And if you look at this, you know, um, uh, Kim Jong-hui is, is, it's unclear whether by, um, uh, by the writing he means his, you know, ca uh, you know calligraphic writing or th sort of the writing of poems, but it's, you know, it's a it's calligraphic work, and it's certainly done in these two, uh, two columns. He's certainly saying, uh, to a certain extent, um, that, um, you know, I don't think about the rules. But if you look closely, it's very much a beautifully executed piece, something that's very much in those rules. So the dialogue with the past isn't always a, um, a rejection of the past, but often a inculcation in something that transcends it. I hope that makes sense. So... <clears throat> Let's look at a few more examples from um, uh, uh, the, the sort of dialogues that occur in space and time. So writing in, uh, in the margins. In East Asia, um, uh, you have the, what I was arguing is a kind of Asia is one, um, in the sense that there's um, a common writing system to China, um, the Korean Peninsula, Japanese islands, the um, area in Vietnam, Vietnam, and other sort of areas around, uh, around China. But there's also a uh, divergence from that. And so in Japan, from about the 10th century, you had the development of something called kana. And kana just means sort of a, a provisional name. Um, but it's a way to express sounds of Japanese in a phonetic way. Japanese and Chinese are linguistically quite distinct. But the Japanese uh, doesn't have, uh, until the 10th century, Japan didn't have any way of writing its own sounds in a completely uh, native way. It used Chinese characters of some, uh, in some way or the other. And basically what they did is they took um, uh, Chinese characters, which you see in the first column, and um, used the sort of grass script or the, um, uh, the highly sort of uh, uh, abbreviated cursive forms uh, to, uh, and standardized them into shapes that, um, uh, that they then read purely for sound. And modern, um, uh, modern uh, Japanese sources too that are used. Um, but why do you need to do that? Well, around the 10th century, you start to get the development of, um, a, um, uh, of imperial sanction um, uh, poetry anthologies. And these, uh, there, there were ways of expressing these, these sounds before that time, but this becomes a um, sort of a, a push for making this um, a, unique, um, uh, a, a unique expression of Japanese language that can only be Japanese. You couldn't write Chinese this way. So in, our collect uh, in the collection here, um, you have uh, pieces like this or like this. And these are album leaves. It has a poet on one side and <clears throat> their name and poem on the other side. And you can see some of the aesthetic possibilities that this raises. Now, this is certainly... And um, I think Chris might have been talking about the walk on row issue, uh, Chris Kersey, I'm sorry, last uh, week, might have talked about the walk on row issue about these uh, poetic anthologies of the Chinese and Japanese poems put right next to each other. And someone like Saigyo Hoshi is a, um, uh, is a monk who wrote in both um, uh, Chinese style and Japanese style. But you can see the, um, even just purely as form, how uh, this phonetic script allows for a whole range of expression, something that is quite distinct from its Chinese context, but allows um, uh, for um, something, a, an expression of Japanese identity, this sort of, uh, sort of um, more delicate um, expression of the, uh, these lines, and maybe different use of brush and like, but it's something that is also um, would have been exciting uh, or meant to be um, exciting and, and a different sort of statement of identity in the, um, uh, in the um, late 17th century. And in Korea, um, one of the, um, uh, around um, the uh, 
uh, in um, uh, the 15th century, there starts to develop um, another kind of writing system. And I think if you look at this, let's see, I think we have a detail here. Um, <coughs> It's a, um, it clearly is quite different from both the, um, uh, the Japanese phonetic script and, of course, Chinese writing. Most, until the 15th century, um, the, the only way to write Korean was um, uh, writing it in Chinese and pronouncing it perhaps as Korean. Um, but this is something initially sort of promulgated theoretically for the less educated, for women, for children, things like that, uh, uh, for uh, groups like that, um, but later um, gets taken up by other, other groups. And you can see a very distinct aesthetic identity, something that can break with the past um, and um, create a, um, a sense of, um, uh, of distinct cultural identity that, um, that sets it apart. And if you ask any Korean person about Hangul, they'll tell you all about King Sejong and how amazing this is, and it's an amazing system. Um, but it's also a point of great, uh, great pride and a statement, in a sense, both visual and, um, uh, and um, sort of conceptual, of a kind of cultural independence uh, from, uh, from China. And you get works like uh, this too, where the um, sort of more uh, sort of formal uh, way that it's uh, written here, the sort of st uh, more standard script, is given this um, um, much more calligraphic style of, uh, of uh, rendition. So, <clears throat> next I want to talk a little bit about um, dialogue, not just across time and cultures, but across categories. For me, one of the exciting things that um, calligraphy does is um, uh, put works that I might not, not normally associate together, so l maybe landscape painting with calligraphy in them or, uh, or the like, um, but it also um, challenges some of the things that we might think of what belongs in art history or what belongs in a museum, and that's what I wanted to see here. And so this uh, just thinking a little about text in relation to images. Now, I spent a lot of time um, uh, just talking about um, how the, um, uh, the texts are something that are um, a, that you can read when we're looking at them in a kind of visual way. Ideally, you know, as a scholar or as a sort of, uh, uh, to appreciate these, you'd uh, be able to read the characters and understand the, the content of them and perhaps understand all of this sort of poetic references like. Um, but that is not absolutely essential. Now, you lose something by, t uh, by sort of ignoring uh, the content and the context of it. And I think there's, uh, so there's a great deal to be said about really understanding the exact uh, context of it. But there's something that if you don't read Chinese, for example, um, that, that you can do with these that, say, a um, native, uh, a, a someone who speaks uh, Chinese or re reads Chinese might not be able to do. Because when you look at a uh, sort of a page of text uh, in English, if you're fluent in English, and look at that, you don't see, in general, each individual letter and word and that sort of thing, unless there's something that calls attention to that. What you're paying attention to is content. Uh, con content. And so the first thing that I tend to do when I look at this is try to read, it, uh, read the content, uh, and especially before I start becoming an incident in calligraphy. But as I was thinking about how do I communicate this, how do I... Um, attempt to make this interesting to like a, what, an 18-year-old uh, in, uh, in Michigan um, who doesn't, uh, doesn't read any of these languages, that there's, a, there's an eye that they can bring to it, a kind of uh, a visual interpretation that they can bring to it that um, is about um, uh, the, the formal qualities as much as the content. And so here's one, um, uh, uh, one um, poem uh, rendered in, um, or a series of poems rendered in the 17th century by a man named Chang Hun Chou. And then um, this is another one, Wang Duo, we've actually seen him before. Uh, also poems, uh, 17th century. And if we look at the two together, Wang Duo and Chang Hun Chou, um, you know, on e either side, think of these, uh, you know, these aren't actually the exact same poem, but if, if um, um, think of how different um, the sort of tone is, the sort of feeling of these, uh, these two. And there's a great deal of communication that's being done in the visual materials, in the formal qualities of each of these characters that tells you something about how one is supposed to read this, how one is supposed to experience this, and what the uh, calligrapher is thinking about this. So you don't actually need to be able to read the content to think about what, what kind of uh, mood is expressed here, what kind of uh, feeling is expressed here, and be able to see that in a very, real, uh, very uh, concrete way. Another 
way to think, uh, think about this is think about the fluidity between our definition of image and text. And so we can look at the tale of Genji, a, a wonderful um, uh, hand scroll, um, illustrated hand scroll <coughs> in, our, in the collection here. So this is from chapter 48. What you have is the text on the right, the title um, in this middle strip. I'm sorry, with my... Yeah, I still don't have that. Um, and then uh, an image uh, illustrate or um, embodying that scene <coughs> to the uh, to the left. So, right here at the top is um, the uh, the um, title of the uh, chapter, Sawa Rabi, uh, and it's written in a phonetic script. One of the great possibilities of this phonetic script is that it's so sort of um, uh, um, simplified that one might not even recognize immediately that this is, is writing. And in a sense, sort of calls one to, uh, to look at other um, sort of lines of similar quality. In the particular image, this, uh, this woman is looking at a piece of paper, uh, probably a, a letter. So she's looking at writing, it's thematized here. <coughs> this plum that's part of uh, the, uh, uh, the poems that are uh, addressed in the poems that are used here has this sweeping, uh, sort of almost calligraphic line. And <laughs> the um, young shoots that are the, um, uh, that, that are the uh, reason for the title, uh, that it called Sawarabi, the reason for the title of this, uh, this chapter, are depicted here. Again, a kind of calligraphic line, something that sort of, you may not immediately recognize these as, um, if you were seen in a different context, as being um, something that's pictorial, as much as simply kind of a, a, um, a gesture of the brush. And then this sort of bits like this, uh, her long hair that you see um, stretching down um, uh, over her back, this almost reads like a long calligra expressive calligraphic line. And of course, the right side is full of this uh, calligraphy that if you w didn't know, say, um, uh, Japanese, you might not immediately uh, recognize this as text. It almost looks like sort of, um, uh, say, trails of, of uh, rain falling down a window. And so all these together suggest a kind of fluidity between what we think of as pictorial, what we think of representational, and um, the, um, uh, the more sort of abstracted, phonetic, linguistic aspects of uh, calligraphy. That's something to keep in mind. Now, this is more explicit in um, works like this. Um, <clears throat> and, and we can see the um, essay, uh, the writing side of this uh, uh, radish, and then <clears throat> the, uh, um, uh, the framing with this bamboo and the, uh, this heavy character in the middle that it's, it's of a piece with the visual representation. And when we're, um, uh, and again, when we were looking at, a, say, a painting with uh, writing on it, we shouldn't separate that painting out and think this is something different or, uh, or separate, but rather integral to the whole. And so here we have an orchid. Now, this is not technical calligraphy except for the uh, red seal in the lower right, but I think you can see, clearly see a sort of calligraphic line. And then when we look at something like this, if you didn't know that this meant in the mist, we, you might still have some association. Something like if you look at the way the, um, uh, the lines um, here and here sort of disappear or fade out, it gives a, um, an impression of almost sort of going to the mist. It sort of demonstrates itself. Now, there's opposites. There's a um, uh, famous image of the word snow that's written in heavy black ink. Um, but thinking about the kind of tone that's suggested um, is, uh, is, is something one can do without um, any sort of uh, linguistic training uh, per se. And this is a particularly, uh, I think, uh, wonderful work called After the Rain by Chen Xian Zhang. And if, um, uh, here's a rough translation, in the mountain, the rain stop and the doves come alive. In the early rain, the pine flowers await a clear morning sky. The wind intoxicates the flowers and the flowers intoxicate the birds, which under the bamboos coo once or twice. <clears throat> so images of um, uh, early morning rain and uh, sort of mist and like, this is very much um, a, um, a, a kind of calligraphic um, uh, representation of that that's certainly um, trying to perform the content of it as well. <clears throat>
And this push back towards pictorialism, this, um, uh, this uh, emphasis on kind of the pictorial qualities of, of, um, uh, of uh, calligraphy is something that I said, you know, early on, say 1300 BCE, you know, a lot of, there were a lot of pictograms, a lot of the characters represented pictures. But as um, writing gets normalized, you know, you stop tending to look for the picture in it. And calligraphy sometimes, uh, cal calligraphers sometimes are sort of recontextualizing and trying to re uh, remind you of the strangeness and the sort of wonderfulness of, uh, of language, the wonder of language. And, but you also get, especially in the 20th century, an increasingly um, uh, sort of emphasis on the pictorial. So here's Kim Dae-jung, uh, the uh, uh, former president of, of South Korea, um, and did this uh, 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 piece for uh, the museum in 2001. And I haven't quite been able to figure out exactly what it's supposed to, to be, but certainly it looks like, um, uh, to me, here's, a, um, uh, here's some sort of man, it looks like an elephant to me, and maybe um, uh, and a character perhaps uh, for it to dance here. But he's very much interested in playing with the kind of pictorial quality uh, of, of the image, reminding us of sort of the, um, the sort of um, aspect of that. And we don't necessarily have to go back to sort of pictorial representation from uh, 1500 BCE. This is simply that writing is words. And in the liter literary studies in recent years, there's a tendency to realize that words are in books, again. That, you know, it sounds kind of obvious, but especially if you think of the current generation of students, they don't read many books, like the kind of, you know, those hard things with all the paper uh, uh, inside. And so the kind of physicality of books, and especially in a, uh, an earlier context, 100 years and earlier, it's all in books. And so that, that sort of material quality of the writing becomes very important. It's something I think that the museum helps us re uh, remind us of. <coughs> And what this allows for is an exploration of sort of formal qualities, um, some of the same things that, say, um, contemporary um, Euro-American artists in the, um, uh, in the 20th century were interested in. Um, so this is, to a certain extent, uh, you know, these are meant to be readable, but it's also meant to be simply an exploration of form stark form of black versus white. This is one of the reasons why sometimes people turn away from calligraphy because it seems so off-putting and, and, um, and so little to see. But think of this like a Rothko or a Franz Klein or something like that, that it's um, as much about abstract form as it is about content. And certainly some uh, piece like this as well, where um, uh, it's a readable character, um, but it's much more an exploration of artist, of, um, of particular sort of um, expression and uh, of an abstract quality of the line on the paper. So what we have here, um, uh, just to uh, give some sort of uh, summary, is that these extremely referential works, works that point back to, say, the fifth century, like the one on top, and reinterpret that, works that revive um, in the um, uh, 19th century um, uh, styles of uh, thousand, uh, thousand plus years ago, and many different ways of defining kind of identity and self and, um, uh, and uh, cultural moment that's completely different. And we have this wonderful opportunity um, to see these um, in the, um, the gallery often, or just simply to notice when a work like a bronze or a painting has that calligraphy on them and to think about what that might mean uh, for the moment. And, you know, fundamentally, I think one of the sort of great pro uh, projects of an art historian is to think about seeing and how we see and what those perspectives mean and how we construct ways of seeing. And I think um, uh, calligraphy, the written word, is a particularly good way to see this and the complexities of um, uh, something as simple as writing your name, writing um, a poem, and, um, and constructing the world through the lines that you make. So, with that, oh my goodness, uh, I, um, uh, I thought I'd uh, stop here. I uh, invite any questions, and I uh, thank you very much for your attention.